we're not going to talk about every way that that happens, but we're going to kind of pull the highlights out, right, the way that Cells control the cell cycle, make sure that they're dividing properly, that DNA is getting copied correctly and put where it goes and all of those sorts of things, right? One of our main goals when it comes to cell division, right? We can rebuild organelles and stuff, but that DNA has got to be copied correctly and it's got to get divided between the cells correctly. So talk a bit about how that happens. We'll talk about the, so, and all of these like checkpoints are basically these enzymatic pathways they can get really complicated. You can like Google image kind of cell enzyme pathways and you get these crazy spider web maps of things. We're going to look at one, the anaphase complex slash cyclosome as an example. It's a nice little tidy little two enzyme situation. Um, just kind of as an example of what can be a really, really complex process. And then we'll talk a bit about cancer, end it on a light note. Um, because when cell cycle fails, that is generally speaking the results, sorry. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> cell cycle, so we're going to talk about what stops it, but we're going to start by talking about what starts it. It's getting really circular this morning. So mitosis, cell division, is driven by protein kinases. And so any kind of like super physiology person would probably cringe if they walk by, but this is how I think about it because I'm not super crazy physiology person, right? So anytime I see ACEs, I know that's an enzyme, right? Enzymes are protein, so that's just redundant. Fine. Kinases, like I kind of think in my head, like kinetic, like they're making something happen. I know. Kinetic, just energy. Hmm? kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. We're going to get to kinetic energy in the next unit. And so, but that's kind of what my head's like. like so this is some kind of protein enzyme that's like doing something. It's making something happen. And so these protein kinases are what are driving mitosis. They're what's actually kind of like fuel is the wrong word, but they're what's driving mitosis, right? Specifically cyclin dependent kinases, which just means they're these kinases, these enzymes that depend on cyclin, right? Which is just another protein. All of these are just kind of like these like chained up links of proteins that are doing things and causing other proteins to do things. It's, it's kind of how like your whole machinery works, basically. Cyclins, easy enough, they are proteins that start the cell cycle. Cyclins, cool. So don't get too tangled up in this graph. All of this, all that this is showing you, right? So, so here, this is the cell cycle, right? G1, S, G2, M, G1, over and over again, right? So M, mitosis right here, right? Is where mitosis is happening. And red is production of cyclin. So you'll notice right before mitosis happens, right back during the synthesis phase, we ramp up and make a bunch of cyclin. So we fill the cell with cyclin. Why? Because those protein kinases that start mitosis are cyclin dependent and they don't work unless you plug a cyclin into them. So they're hanging out in the cell, but your cell's just not like mitosising over and over again because they don't do anything unless your cell is also producing cyclin. So you need both parts. So the enzymes can hang out. And when your cell is ready to go through mitosis, you make a bunch of cyclin, cyclins attached to the cyclin dependent kinases, right? And then kick off mitosis, all right? So it's kind of this, yeah, it's kind of the way the machinery gets started so to speak, All right? So that's how we're gonna worry about that. That's as much as we're gonna worry about that, rather. Now, once your cell, right, we've made our cycle and we're starting mitosis, or we're starting the cell cycle, right? There are different points where your cell will check and make sure everything is as it should be. All right, we're gonna talk about three different checkpoints in the whole cell cycle. So there's one in mitosis, one right before mitosis and one that's way back here in gap one. All right, so we've got the gap one checkpoint, gap two checkpoint, and then the spindle checkpoint that we'll walk through. So gap one is where, not that your cells are like making decisions, pondering things, but this is where the determination whether or not to divide happens, right? Because G1, nothing was really 
kind of being definitively decided upon, right? We're kind of growing a bit, we're making some stuff, but we're not really, you know, we're not copying DNA or anything. It's kind of hanging out. And so at the G1S checkpoint, right, if you kind of think of like a little gate that's got to be passed through, your cell is going to check to make sure that all the DNA in a cell is in good order, that the cell is in good health, right? It's not like starving cell or lacking some kind of growth factor or resource or something that the cell would need, right? Like, is this cell a cell that we actually want to copy? Or is it kind of like a, a junky cell, right? So if the DNA is okay and the cell is in good health, then it goes into S phase and we copy our DNA. Cool. So that's the G1S checkpoint. Next, we hit the G2M checkpoint, right? So logically it is between GAP2 and M phase. And so at that point, your cell assesses whether or not it copied the DNA correctly, right? Because we had one copy of each of our 46 chromosomes. We make 46 copies of each of those chromosomes, right? All those pairs of sister chromatids. But did we do a good job? Did we actually copy everything? Did we copy, copy all of everything, right? So if there's any kind of improper replication or if we see some kind of DNA damaging agent, something is causing the DNA to degrade or to be damaged in some way, right? Then we don't pass this checkpoint and we don't move on to mitosis. But replication looks okay. DNA seems to be in good order. We pass the G2M checkpoint and move into mitosis. So we go through mitosis and we hit the spindle checkpoint. Kind of our making sure we are properly organized checkpoint, right? So we've got spindles, each spindle is making all these microtubules. Every microtubule from each side is connecting to a kinetochore on a sister chromatid, right? So that theoretically each pair of sister chromatids is connected to one microtubule and they're each going to opposite sides of the cell. So that's what we're checking here. Is each chromosome attached to a spindle? and then arrange properly on the middle of the plate so that when anaphase happens, right, they go to opposite sides. So that you get one copy of each of, for example, in us, one copy of each of the 46 chromosomes on each end, right? So everything's copied, everything's attached well, it's all nice and lined up in the middle of the plate. We pass the spindle checkpoint and the cell divides. Cool. Now, Let's walk through this one little enzyme pathway. It's just a little one. Don't be so bad. Um, it's got, we'll call it the APCC because the whole name is the anaphase promoting complex or cyclosome. APCC. Right? So we have that spindle checkpoint. We're talking about making sure everything's lined up on this metaphase plate. So we're in what phase of mitosis? Sure. Everything's lined up on the metaphase plate. Then we're, in, then we're in metaphase, right? And so at that point, if we pass that spindle checkpoint, we go into anaphase, right? And this is how we go into anaphase. So this APCC, right? Here's kind of, here's all our parts. Here's our APCC. Here's cohesin. We've talked about cohesin. What's cohesin doing? You remember? Keep the cell together. What was that? Keeping the cells together. Keeping it's keeping something together. It's got that kind of cohesion idea into it. What's it? What is cohesion holding together? What are we about to pull apart? The sister chromatids, right? Each chromosome and its copy at this point in metaphase are being held together by the sticky protein cohesin, right? Now we've got these two other enzymes that are floating around in the cell. All right, so the APCC, now let's, we'll get to the APCC. Let's talk about securin. Securin is an enzyme, it's an inhibitor. So it's inhibiting something. What it's inhibiting, is another enzyme called separase. Really creative with these, right? So we've got securin 
that is inhibiting separase, which is a protease, another kind of enzyme. Separase, if left to its own devices, dissolves cohesin. But as long as securin is around, it's just kind of securin's going around stopping separase from dissolving cohesin. So the APCC, when we pass the spindle checkpoint, right, is going to mark securin to get destroyed in the cell, right? Because prior to this point, securin is kind of holding separase back. But the APCC is going to be like, we pass spindle checkpoint, it's time for anaphase, destroy all the securin. So the securin gets destroyed, it's gone. If nothing, if there's no securin, then now separase is free to do whatever it wants. All right? Now separase is free to do whatever it wants. What it wants is to destroy cohesin. Right? So you have these two sister chromatids, right? This kind of tug of war situation, right? They're attached to the spindle, but they're held together at that little cohesin protein between them. So this is like just cutting the rope in the tug of war, right? Separase comes in, destroys the cohesin, and the chromatids come apart. And they're attached to the spindle, so they get sucked back to either pole of the cell. And so this is basically how anaphase happens, right? You get to metaphase, cells like, yeah, everything looks all right. Kill the securin. And there it goes, right? So. We have all of these ways to control the cell cycle, but like us as a whole, our cells are only human, right? So mistakes happen basically, right? And so when the cell cycle controls fail, what the general result is, is cancer. Cancer is a failure to control the cell cycle, right? It's unregulated growth, which is unregulated cell division. This uncontrolled growth of cells and this kind of failure to control cell division or to stop damaged cells from dividing. All right. And so there, as we're kind of generally aware, there are many, many kinds of cancer. There are many mechanisms by which this happens. We're just going to kind of pull to general examples just to kind of look at how this can happen. Right. And so starting with the P53 gene. So the P53 gene that we should have is a tumor suppressor gene, right? Sounds like a good thing to have, suppresses tumor formation by working at the G1 checkpoint, right? Remember that G1 checkpoint where we just check and make sure that the DNA is in good order, right? We've got good DNA, the cell is healthy. So the, your P53 gene monitors the integrity of DNA, right? Is the DNA oh. in proper shape, right? And so if the DNA is damaged, right? Mutated, damaged somehow, it stops cell division. You don't pass the G1 checkpoint, right? If the DNA is damaged. So P53 is monitoring the integrity of the DNA. If the DNA is somehow damaged, it stops cell division and also starts, there are enzymes that can repair DNA that's become damaged or mutated. And so your P53 gene will kind of hit the go button on enzymes that will repair DNA. And so if the DNA can be repaired, then you pass the G1 checkpoint and you go on with cell division. Otherwise, if the DNA is so damaged that it cannot be fixed, then it causes cell death, right? That cell is no longer functioning properly. The DNA is too damaged. And so the cell is sliced. Okay, so we've got this P53 gene now. If your P53 gene doesn't work, right, then it isn't checking to make sure the DNA is in good shape, then you can have cells that have damaged DNA that then continue to replicate. And they'll replicate repeatedly, and this can lead to tumor growth cancer. So you have a P53 gene from both parents, right? We've got two copies of every gene in us, right? So you have two copies of P53. And we're gonna get more into dominant and recessive. We'll do some Mendelian genetics kind of things later, but all you need to know right now, right? So I have two copies of P53. Damage to P53, right? Whether or not they lead to cancer is recessive because 
say one of mine is damaged. It mutates, it doesn't work, right? One of my copies is no good. As long as I inherited one working copy, I'm okay, right? As long as I've got AP53 AP gene that's working, right? I'm all right. And so we call mutations like that recessive, right? Because basically I have to inherit two damaged versions of P53 to actually have a problem, right? So as long as you have one working, you can control your cell cycle, right? So we say that that is a recessive mutation versus a dominant one, where if you just get one copy, you have a problem, which is the case for oncogenes, right? So oncogenes can cause, can cause cells to become cancerous, right? So these are kind of two examples that are working in opposite directions, right? P53 is actively stopping cells from becoming cancerous. And so damage to P53 removes that control, develops, things can develop into cancer. Oncogenes are actually causing cells to divide uncontrollably. They kind of mess with the regulation systems and cause things to divide uncontrollably. So inheriting an oncogene can lead to cancer, right? Now you can screen for these sort of things. You can do kind of genetic screening to see if you're kind of predisposed to various kinds of cancers. You can look for proto-oncogenes, right? So proto-oncogenes are genes that if they happen to mutate can become cancerous. Right. So it's like a risk factor sort of check, right? If, you've got, if there are these proto-oncogenes present, they can become oncogenes if there's some kind of mutation, right? And so this leads, like I mentioned, to the loss of control of cell growth. So they, they kind of mess with, well, they mess with release and reception of growth factors. They kind of like, basically there's an on switch for cell control that gets turned on and off, right? All these, all the cyclins and things. And so if you have one of these oncogenes, it basically just slams the on switch and leaves it on. The cell will just continue to divide uncontrollably. Right? And these mutations are dominant, right? Because instead of having something that's controlling and keeping things in place, you have something that's coming in and messing it all up, right? So you have two copies, for example, of one of these proto-oncogenes. And if they're proto-oncogenes, they're just hanging out. But if one of them becomes an oncogene and hits the on switch, the on switch is hit, right? It doesn't matter that you still have a regular copy, right? So we say that this is dominant. You only need one mutated copy, one proto-oncogene to become an oncogene, right? To go turn cell division on full tilt. Right. So we got this kind of tumor suppressor gene in P53, and then this oncogene idea that just is causing uncontrolled replication. All right, I think, I think, and I'm correct. That is the bright and sunny end of chapter 10. Straight up where chapter, they're just like, and that's horrible, bye. So, <laughs> so that is the end of chapter 10. That's the end of the material for the exam. Let's take just a tick and see if we remember any of chapter 10. Oh, Lord. There you go. Okay. We'll see. Maybe we'll run through it real quick. Who knows? It could happen. So, in chapter 10, which was all just cell division, it's all that was in chapter 10, we started pretty simple. We started with prokaryotes, right? Because they generally just have kind of the one chromosome, they don't have organelles. Right? There's not a whole lot to keep track of. It's a pretty simple process, right? And so, prokaryotes divide by binary fission. Right. And we kind of broke it into three general steps. What are the three steps of binary vision? Step one. Is it cell elongation, septum? Not septum. yet. What was the first step? All I put is cell divide to produce two new cells for chaotic cells. You have, you have let yourself down. No, that's good. Does anybody have any more than that in their notes? What's the first step? DNA replication, DNA replication happens first, right? We've got that circular chromosome. It's got a little point of origin, a little site of termination. So we beep, boop, make a copy, right? From like kind of 12 o'clock to six o'clock and we get two copies. Then what happens? 
Yeah, then we have cell elongation. That's step two. And then step three. Yeah, and then that's when septation happens, right? Little plate, little septum basically forms in the center, break apart. We've got two new bacterial cells, each with a copy of the original chromosome. Cool, binary fission. Now, eukaryotes have lots of chromosomes, sometimes like lots and lots. What is a chromosome specifically? pairs of DNA that you share with the mother and father? So yeah, so it's, that's getting there. DNA that you inherit from your parents, but a chromosome is specifically just what? Is that the 26 and 23? 23 and 23? There you go. <laughs> Those are, yes, you have 46 of them. Yeah. What are they? You get 23 from each parent. Slow down, back up. So yeah, we're going to replicate them. We're going to make copies of them. Okay. What are what are we making copies of? DNA. Yeah, that's it. It's just a, a single DNA molecule. Right? We talked about these macro molecules, right? Way back, what was that? Chapter three that happened, right? And so chromosomes are just single DNA molecules, just these polynucleotides. That's all. All right. Now they are soup. They're huge. They're really really long. So what's chromatin then? So chromosomes, every chromosome is a single DNA molecule. If we start talking about chromatin, what are we talking about? What are we trying to describe? DNA that is stored and spooled and organized. Yeah, it's the, so DNA is like all long and stringy and like a big pile of thread. Chromatin is where you take that chromosome and you spool it all up, right? And keep it all nice and compact for things like mitosis, right? So how does chromatin form? We kind of walked through the steps, right? Getting from this big pile of stringy DNA to chromatin. So what does that look like? I've got like a big long loose strand of DNA. If I wanted to pack it up, what's step one? Yes, that is precisely. Yeah, so you've got those little histones or kind of these little positively charged proteins. The DNA is a bit negatively charged, sticks to it. So it gets kind of spooled around all these histones. DNA wrapped around a histone is called, mm -hmm, it's called a nucleosome. We can start coiling these nucleosomes around each other, kind of wind it up even tighter, that thing. Bunch of spooled up nucleosomes. Yeah, it's a solenoid. And then lots of other molecular things happen and it varies with species. And all. Well, so we kind of skip to the end over the kind of muddy part. So we've got all these solenoids, they keep compacting down. And the most, most, most compressed version of a chromosome is called mitotic chromatin because we're only going to be that compressed right before mitosis, right? So a mitotic chromatin, kind of the most compacted ver version of these chromosomes. Cool. All right, so then we got into the cell cycle, right? The big one, the big kind of circle we drew. Is that PTMA2? Is it what, what? PTMA2, prophase? Pro oh yeah, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, yeah. Almost, we're one before that. So before we talk about the five phases of mitosis, oh, G1. G1, what's happening in G1? Growth. Growth, then what? S. S. New set of DNA. Right, we synthesize a copy of DNA. Then we? D2, which is second growth, is growth spindles and microtubules. Right, we start, start making all those microtubules, the spindles, all those cytoskeletal elements, right, that we're going to use to organize all those chromosomes. So those first three phases, what do we call those kind of as a group? Uh, inter wait, inter yeah, interface time between cells. 
Yeah, interphase. All right. And then there were two other phases. What were the two other phases? Mitosis and cytokinesis, right? Mitosis is kind of the actual dividing of all the middle stuff in the cell and cytokinesis, division of cytoplasm. And what do we call those two phases together? M phase, right? The mitotic phase. So we've got this whole cell cycle. Now, of the cell cycle, interphase is the longest phase, but most cells are not participating in this circle here. Where are they? Where are most of your cells most of the time? P0, which is the rest, rest in state, respiration, relaxed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, most of your cells are just hanging out in G0. They're not getting ready to divide. They're just doing the cell stuff, right? Respirating, photosynthesizing with your plant, whatever it is they need to be doing, right? Cool. So interphase, we walked through interphase. We broke M phase down more, right, into the five stages or phases of mitosis. Stage one of mitosis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So what's from phase, which is um, condensation occurs, stimulus form. Yeah. Yeah. How do we know that prophase has started? The early PR is first. That does happen during prophase. If you're just watching a cell, how do you know you're in prophase? What's the before that, that does happen. What can you see in a cell when it enters prophase? The chromosomes, you can see the individual chromosomes. So normally, right, in interphase or in G0, if you look at a cell, the nucleus just looks like a solid circle because the DNA is just kind of like all, it's like a big pile of spaghetti. In prophase, everything's condensed down and you can actually see the individual chromosomes in the nucleus. And that is prophase. When we get there, then the nuclear envelope dissolves, Golgi body, endomembranes, well, yeah, the endomembrane system all breaks down. All right, let's prophase, prometaphase. What happens? Yep. Yep. All those microtubules attached to what are they attaching to on the chromosomes? Fibers. They are fibers. They are attaching to. It was a weird word. It sounds like something that would run like a spaceship or something. I don't know why. That could be a lot. <laughs> it starts with a K. Uh, yeah, that. What was it? Something like that. It is something like that. Anybody got that one? No. Yeah. The kinetochore. There you go. It sounds like something they'd have to go in in a sci fi movie and like remove a crystal from or something. I don't know. The kinetochore. But in your cell, the kinetochores are just these little plates that the spindles attach their fibers to. Yeah. In prometaphase, they start moving towards the center. And then what happens? Then who's, what's next? Oh, um, you got metaphase. Metaphase and metaphase. What happens? Everything in the middle. Everything in the middle. On the metaphase plate, right? in the middle. And then? And phase, which is the shortest phase, can yep. easily remove under tension sister chromatids pulled toward poles. Yep. Yep. Anaphase, cohesion is destroyed, right, by separase. Talked about that today. Blah. And they go flying back to the poles. Anaphase. Isn't there an anaphase A? Anaphase A. They remember. Whoop. There is an anaphase A and B. So I'm there. All right. So anaphase A, they come apart. Anaphase B, what happens? They um, come together. Poles move. Not yet. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. It moves apart with B. Yeah, right. It kind of matches that binary vision. It, it elongates, right? Everything moves to the poles, and then the cell actually, it's like the chromosomes move, and they get to the poles, and then the poles move, and like the whole thing starts to spread apart. 
Glam face. All right, what's next? Oh, uh, you got uh, tail phase. Tail phase, what happens in tail phase? Pro phase in reverse, which is um, the chromosome is relaxed and we are able to reform. Yeah. Basically, we put everything back like we found it, right? We kind of loosen up the DNA, we wrap it in a nuclear envelope again, put all our endomembrane stuff back together, the ER and the Golgi body, right? We get everything back how it goes in two ends of this kind of weird long cell. And then. So, Kinesis getting two cells. Yeah, all those, all those things. Yeah. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Good reading. Good. Cytokinesis. Yeah, is the division of the cytoplasm in animal cells because they're squishy, right? They can just kind of they make a big belt of those actin filaments and kind of tighten it up until it pops into what do we call that tightening down? Something. What's it called? Just for furrow. Yep, the cleavage furrow, where we're going to cleave them into, it forms a furrow. Yeah, but in plants, they got a cell wall, so they can't just kind of like cinch and pop themselves. So they actually build a little cell plate, a little wall in between them. And that's what you got to plant cells. All right. Whew. Then we got to what we talked about today, cell cycle checkpoints. When do they happen and what's being checked? We've got three checkpoints we talked about today. First checkpoint. G1, G2, endo checkpoint. Yeah, G1, the G1S is first. What is the G1 checkpoint checking for? It determines if needing to divide or sell if to see if the cell is in a, in a good condition or order, and um and if the cell does not if if it doesn't <laughs> just it, yeah, it got to yeah. be good enough to copy it got to be good enough to copy yeah yeah yes is the cell ready to be copied is the DNA okay is the cell okay do we have enough resources to actually complete the process, right? Because we're going to spend a lot of energy and stuff. So we got to make sure we got enough stuff to do the thing, right? That's the G1 checkpoint. So if we pass the G1 checkpoint, we go into S phase, we replicate our DNA. What's the next checkpoint? The G2M, right? Yeah, on the other side, yeah. And assesses DNA replication. Yeah, yes, assesses replication. So we've made a copy of our DNA. Did we actually do a good job? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. If we did, we passed the G2 checkpoint. We've got well, one more. Spindle checkpoint. spindle checkpoint. What are we checking for at the spindle checkpoint? Chromosomes are organized in some kind yeah. of attached. Are chromosomes attached to the spindles? Are they organized properly so that when the cohesin dissolves, things actually go where they're supposed to go? That's the spindle checkpoint. Whew. All right. So then, we ended talking about how what happens when cell cycle control fails. We used two examples. What was one example? That was like 10 minutes ago. Just it just happened. Oh, yeah. So oncogenes was one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you have a proto oncogene that mutates and becomes an oncogene, what happens? Right, cancer. cancer, cancer, it's generally better. cancer, right? Because they kind of muck up the regulatory stuff. They basically like go into the factory and like slam the on switch on, right? And then the cells just start dividing without any sort of control on them at all. So that's bad. Oncogenes. What was the other one? It's the other way that we can kind of lose control of the cell cycle that we talked about. The tumor? The tumor. Suppression? Tumor suppressor genes, right? That P53 gene. What does the P53 gene do? It suppresses tumors, right? Yeah, what is it? Where where is it working? What part of the cell cycle is it working? <laughs> the G1 checkpoint, right? P53 is the dude that's over there checking to make sure the DNA is in good shape, right? And if it's not in good shape, what is what does it do? Was it try to do first? 
It might slice and dice, but if it, what does it try before, before it destroys the cell? It's like, oh no, the DNA is all messed up. It tries to fix it first, right? Wakes up some enzymes, like see if you can make this better. If it can't make it better, then that cell is, is done so. So how do you, where does cancer, where does a breakdown in the cell cycle come in then? Because P53 seems helpful. Oh, I yeah. yeah, so you have to have at least you have to have at least one good one, right? If you inherit mutated p53 genes from both of your parents that don't work, or something happens to your p53 genes, right? Then then the dude whose job it is to sit there and make sure that things are going right is gone, right? So then you can have damaged cells that start replicating, and that can lead to cancer. Whew. All right. And that is chapter 10. That is the end of the exam material. The exam is over chapter four, five, and 10. So organelles, protein pathways, cell membranes, cell division, all the cell stuff, all right? So yes, if you haven't turned in the lecture journal or quiz today, do that. Don't, don't miss points that are just sitting there for you. Um, and I'll get the unit assignment submission thing fixed. And that is due Thursday night before the exam on Friday. Friday, we will be in person over there, 221. Everybody, including myself, will be in person taking the exam. If you have sports stuff, there is some sports stuff going on. Email me, let me know. We'll set up and make that.